Hey everybody, welcome on back to the Twisted History Podcast. This week is the Twisted History of Luck. Um, before we start, I have one uh, letter to the editor, one DM. It's from a guy named Eric Lush. Lush? L-E-U-S-C-H. Loish? Loish, I believe. That's, <gasps> that's Loish, my right? guess. Hey, Large, just catching up on Twisted and finally heard the Mascots podcast. I'm only talking about this because we've gotten more feedback on mascots than I think anything else. I, you know, people have shitty uh, mascots all around. I live in rural Alaska. A village up here, Antioch, has a mascot called the Half Breeds. Not fucking bad. That's kind of bad. Yeah. That's right? tough. Yeah. Have you ever heard of, like the word half breed be used in anything but? Yeah. Um. So anyway, <laughs> so to make it a touch worse, the mascot is a picture of a white man and a native woman. The village is super proud of the name as it has a lot to do with those history and have refused to change it multiple times. I checked the, because, you know, a lot of times people send me stuff that's no longer exists, you know, like certain things have been thrown out. The Antioch half-breeds is a white dude looking at an Inuit woman with a rifle and harpoon crossing. I, I, I think this is one of those ones you let go. I think this is okay. On December 4th, just to let you know, there's still a very active and flourishing and probably wonderful school. On December 14th of last year, the Halfbreeds placed third at a state volleyball tournament. They represented the Greater Kuskokwim Conference. The state mixed six tournament took place at Palmer High School, home of the Moose. In first place, the Tenalian Lynx of Port Owlsworth. In second place, the Shishmarif Northern Lights. These are all like names that make sense, you know, being in Alaska. In third was the Antioch Halfbreeds, and in fourth was the Golovin Lynx. So it looks like there were two Lynx teams. It is what it is, but I'd wear the T-shirt, and I'd probably get fucking killed for it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm all for originality, but I don't know. I don't know about the Halfbreeds. I have one more blatantly racist thing to point out uh, towards the end of this podcast. You'll know when I'm talking about it. But this one reminds me of one of the Texas schools. I don't know if they were the, the whoa, the cotton pickers. The cotton pickers, yeah. Yeah. Then there was the white faces or something like that. They were the yep. uh, the cattle. The cattle with the white face. Yeah, that's right? right. It was like the steers that have the white face. All right, so that that was just something that was sent in. Another person had sent in um, how they like when I talk about boxing. They're not interested in boxing and actually, John had said it. John throws around compliments like fucking manhole covers. But he loves when I talk about something because I'm, I'm passionate about it. It's my favorite sport by far. And so I love that. I'll, I'll try to mix in boxing stories every now and again. I have one, but I don't know if I'm going to tell it today. Uh, on to luck. <clears throat> All right, so it's on to luck, the twisted history of luck. It's myself. It's Vibs. It's Jack Coleman. It's the Saint. And John actually had a story. I don't know if he's going to come in or, and tell it or not about some sort of plane crash. So John Kelly is still around on the scene, and uh, otherwise it's busy me, Jack, and uh, Annie. Welcome back. Over the past couple of weeks, people who listen to this podcast, uh, thank you very much, and you know that I've mentioned uh, Sutomo Yamaguchi and Violet Jessup, and we've spoke about both of these people, these individuals, as whether or not they were the luckiest or unluckiest people to ever live. Uh, Sutomo Yamaguchi, for people who don't know, had survived the bombing of Hiroshima, he then jumped on a plane, excuse me, a train, basically the next day, got home, went to work, and survived the uh, bombing of Nagasaki. Only man known to survive both bombings. And then Violet Jessup is also known as being a lucky person because she was on three ships that essentially sank. The Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic. So, and I believe she was the only woman to have done that. So... We mentioned, are they the luckiest or the unluckiest people alive? I guess in their perspective, they're the luckiest because they survived. But they're not uh, the luckiest people if you happen to have a seat next to them on a plane or a boat. Then we talked once before about this girl from Serbia. Her name was Vesna Vulovic. Twisted History of Bad Bitches might have been the name of it. She was the sole survivor of a plane explosion that killed 27 of 28 people on board. She was the 28th. In a crash landing, she allegedly fell 33,300 feet. 33,300 feet, right? She was trapped inside the plane's fuselage. She was paralyzed, sustained a variety of broken bones. She spent 16 months in the hospital after the incident. If you don't remember, she had low blood pressure. 
And so when she took the physical to become a flight attendant, she had like six cups of coffee that day. Get her heart rate and her blood pressure going. It's the only reason that she became a flight attendant. Otherwise, she would have been nixed and left on the ground. That low blood pressure is probably what saved her life as she fell 33,000 feet from the sky. What also saved her life is that the plane fuselage that she was stuck in had hit a mountain on the way down at an angle where it essentially turned into a luge. So all these things had happened, and she recovered without any memory of the fall. I think it was Paul McCartney that awarded her uh, awarded her the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest fall ever survived in the history of man. All right? So that was Vesna Volovich. You remember when we spoke about her? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So she, she sticks out. So all of these little tidbits, Jessup, Sutomo, Vesna... It made me want to dig deeper. And when you just simply Google luckiest people alive, you do get a lot of generic answers. Like right away, somebody had said that Joan Ginther is the luckiest person alive. She's not. She's not the luckiest person alive. She's a mathematician from Texas who lived in Las Vegas. She's called the luckiest woman in the world because she's won multi-million dollar jackpots four times in the lottery. All in Vegas, Vegas lotteries, I didn't even know the lottery was legal in Vegas. I thought there was something. I don't know. So anyway, all in Vegas, and she raked in $20 million between 1993 and 2010. But because of Ginther's background in statistics, she has a PhD from Stanford. You know, Stanford, which is much better than USC, as, as Vibs points out. There's speculation that she's not lucky at all, but rather knows how to play the odds just right. So maybe that's not luck. Maybe she shouldn't be called the luckiest woman in the world. Maybe I'd call bullshit on her. But what about Bill Morgan, truck driver in Australia, Vibs? He's, you know, kind of like me. My kind of guy. Yeah. So he has a heart attack behind the wheel. I think you'll like this story. This guy has a heart attack behind the wheel. Um, He gets into a crash. He gets rushed to the hospital. He's dead for like 14 minutes. His heart stopped 14 minutes. And I think if your heart stops for seven minutes, and we all know this, unfortunately, because of the NFL player who just got hurt. If your heart stops for like seven minutes, that's when you're officially declared dead. I think that's the threshold. So people say like he died twice or something. He was dead. He was dead for 14 minutes. He gets revived in the hospital again after 14 minutes and he's comatose and he's in a coma for 15 months. And then the doctors convince his family to pull the plug. So the guy wasn't having a good year, right? His sisters say, no, no, I don't. One of the doctors who was visiting there said, we have another treatment that we're fucking around with. We're not even sure if it's legal. They start that treatment on him. They take him off of life support. He survives. The treatment works. He wakes up. He fully recovers. To me, that's one of the luckiest people on, on earth. He immediately goes out. He goes to a deli an Optimo, a fucking 7-Eleven in Australia, whatever they call it down there, and he plays a scratch-off ticket. And the scratch-off ticket, he wins a car. It's 1998. The car is worth $27,000. So he's a very lucky guy. Fully loaded car. Yeah, fully loaded $28,000 Nissan Elantra. The local news hears about this, as they tend to do, right? And they want to recreate it, sort of like news crews do. So they say, hey, listen, can you go back in the store, grab another scratchy, then come out and we'll have it as the B-roll while we're telling your story. So he says, yeah, pays for another scratchy or whatever it is with his own money. And he pulls two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's fucking hot. What a guy. Yeah, like that's that's hot. And I'm happy for him. Like I like so an Australian truck driver coming out of a coma, his family pulls the plug. I'm sure he's pissed about it. And then goes, pulls a car, and pulls $250,000. That's a better story. Would you tell them if the family pulled the plug? Like, know. oh, you did it. We never <laughs> we never did that. Yeah. No. We... Yeah. I guess it's written down, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah. He's like, yeah. how come there wasn't a, you know, a tube in or anything? And they're like, no, no, they don't use tubes anymore. It's 1998. We're in Australia. We're so fucking cutting edge. Um, there's another guy from Croatia. His name is Frayn Selak. These are just two random dudes who I think kind of relate to the first girl that I call bullshit on. It's the only reason I'm bringing this up. And Frayn is not famous by any stretch of the imagination. But if you do Google his name right away, most lucky guy to ever uh, exist. 
1962. He's in a train. It flips off the uh, tracks, and it goes into a freezing river. They pull him to shore while 17 other passengers drown. Okay? He just had a broken arm and some hypothermia. He skips death once. A year later, during his first and only plane ride, the plane is landing. This plane was packed. I read his story. He seems like me. Kind of a fat guy. Looks like he drinks too much vodka and probably has too many sausages. The plane is packed, and uh, but he winds up getting like a seat on it, sitting with the stewardesses, steward eye, at the back of the plane. Yep. My grandpa always says, if you if you get on a plane, you can and you can do it. Sit yeah. in the back with the stewardesses. It's yeah. the safest spot. 1963. Uh, like yeah. I'm sure he could schmooze your way on a plane in 63. So he's in the back, literally having like coffee with the stewardesses, and then all of a sudden they go into the landing pattern. As they're landing, something goes wrong. A door blows off. He gets sucked out the door. <laughs> sucked out the door. Frayne Selak. He lands in a, and this is where it gets a little bit weird. And I know people question the story. So do I, but I love telling it because he's me. He's the Croatian me. He gets, hey, ladies. Yeah. So what's it like, you know, being a student? He gets sucked out the window, sucked out the door. He lands in a haystack. <laughs> the rest of the plane crashes. 19 people killed. 19 people killed. And he, you know, he gets it still with his coffee in his hand. Three years later. A bus he was traveling on skids off the road into the river again, drowning four passengers. He swam safely to shore with a few cuts and bruises. Two years after that, he was teaching his youngest son how to hold a gun. As he realizes that the safety was coming off, his son fires the gun. It shoots Frayne in the testicles, mm. he, which he then has to have his testicles removed. But he wasn't killed, right? I'd rather lose my nuts which Andy keeps in a jar, then then lose my life. Yeah, so again, as, not the shaft. You're good. Yeah, you're as fine. long as they don't hit that fucking veiny <laughs> yeah. shaft of mine, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Well, she, veiny shaft of yours, I guess. Um, Seventy and seventy three, his car catches fire, absolutely unharmed. Nineteen ninety five, apparently the eighties were pretty boring for him. He's struck by a bus, sustained only minor injury. A year later, nineteen ninety six. He uh, was driving down a road just like you would see it on any kind of movie, like a hairpin turn, a bus is coming at him. He went through the barrier, but he gets tossed from the car and watches as his car goes into 300-foot gorge and explodes. You know, so he, he escapes death one more time. He was not wearing his seatbelt, and so he's ejected when the car door flew open. One of the times I feel like it's yeah smart to not wear a seatbelt. Yeah, seatbelts are for I pussies. feel like they're, they're awesome, except yeah, for that screw instance. Yeah, seatbelts fucking noises i can't his, believe you landed in the haystacks dude. yeah it that's, can't that's happen absurd. it's like assassin's creed or something yeah that's or insane. or uh <laughs> domino right from um deadpool yeah right the girl who has like that unlimited luck so his friends eventually were hesitant getting in any vehicle with him which i i would understand didn't want to go on trips with him nothing there came a stage he said when i was lucky to have any friends at all many stopped seeing me saying it was bad karma and this is how i'm topping it all off in 2003 Two days after his 73rd birthday, Frayn Selak won a staggering 1.1 million in the Croatian National Lottery. That's lucky. Like, that to me is a better lucky story. So, if you're going to Google stuff to see if you want to know who's the luckiest people in the world, tread lightly because they have some bullshit people like the mathematician from Stanford, okay? But I'm going to go to a guy that I'm shocked we don't talk about more, particularly you. I'm actually disappointed that you don't talk about him more because uh, I, I think you like Teddy Roosevelt. I do. I do. And I think you know stuff about him. I do. And I think that one day when we do the Twisted History of Teddy Roosevelt, I think that will be our new niche for the dozen. Oh, I'd, I'd, lo I'd love that. Yeah. Right. Teddy Roosevelt was, seems like a guy that uh, uh, born well off and then wanted to become tough and be cool and he did everything he could to, to do that. He, so many adventures, do, getting in fights, boxing, all that. It's exactly right. He was a wealthy dude. And if you look at Teddy Roosevelt's most famous quotes, they're all terrible. It's all like, you know, never take the easy road. Like, it's all inspirational it, shit that doesn't resonate. Man with in me. the arena is yeah, him. I, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't take a lot of inspiration from his quotes, but I do from his life. And, you know, like people say, who's the Rushmore? He's literally on Rushmore. 
and we don't speak about him more. I think it's because I constantly put off, no, save it for the Teddy Roosevelt thing. Save it for the Teddy Roosevelt thing. I'm not going to do that today because we're talking about the twisted history of luck, and Teddy Roosevelt had an assassination attempt, which I think a lot of people know about. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. So I'm going to give you so much fucking information about this. <laughs> Excuse my language. I am. I'm going to give you so much information about Teddy Roosevelt and his assassination attempt that that might be the niche category. Teddy Roosevelt's assassination, right? Why he the hell would I do it? He really he was, a, was stud. a stud. I highly recommend if you guys are coming to New York to go to uh, Keen's, Keen's Chop House. It's one of the only places around that you can still get mutton. And a mutton chop is a little bit weird. It looks like a, almost like a the cross section of a stingray. A mutton chop. Mm. It has like the flaps and whatnot. Have you ever had mutton? I, I haven't. I don't Yeah, so no. mutton is like an aged lamb, right? So if you're lamb chops and all of a sudden you're a lamb chop on mutton for, for all intents and purposes. So it's one of the few places that serve it. And Keens has got a bunch of pipes up. People used to keep their pipes there to smoke. And there's a room that they have that Teddy Roosevelt used to frequent um, exclusively when he went there when, uh, when he was in New York. And I'm going to get to his whole history in just one sec. So, October 4th, 1912. I'm going back to 1912. Teddy was leaving a Milwaukee hotel for a campaign stop. Which campaign? I'll get to it. And he was shot in the chest by a guy named John Schrank. John Schrank was a saloon keeper from New York City. Schrank's bullet lodged in Roosevelt's rib, but it had been slowed precipitously by the 50-page speech and the eyeglass case that was tucked into his coat pocket. We've seen this a thousand times in movies. Oh my God, it hit the lucky yeah, dime. A, a classic right? trope for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it hit my cell phone. But it happened to Teddy Roosevelt. A 50-page notebook, small notebook, and an eyeglass case slowed the bullet down and it lodged in a rib that was directly in front of his heart, by the way. Okay? That's, that's luck. Okay? And Shrank was originally looking to shoot him in the head. So he had his pistol raised higher. But a spectator named Adam Bittner saw what Shrank was doing and just hit his arm tiny bit. Just enough that it went down and hit him in the chest. Again, you don't have a fucking uh, notebook and an eyeglass case anywhere on your head. So that's lucky. It's lucky that he hit it down and it went right in. That's, that's the definition of luck as far as I'm concerned. As soon as that had happened, a mob tackles Shrank. Obviously, Teddy was a very uh, loved politician. A mob tackles Shrank, and they started to beat the shit out of him. Somebody said, fetch me some rope, and they're about to string him up. They're about to string him up right there. It's 1912. That shit happens. <laughs> so Teddy sees this happening after he just gets shot in the chest, and he says to the people, don't hurt the poor creature. And so everyone backed away. A couple of cops grabbed Shrank, and they brought him into the hotel, and they kind of kept him safe so he'd eventually go on trial. So a little bit of forgiveness turning the other cheek right there, okay? Then Roosevelt refused medical attention and addressed his audience with a 90-minute speech. I have the manuscript. Obviously, I did. And here are the opening comments. Just the opening comments, although I'd do the whole 90-minute speech if I could. This is Theodore Roosevelt's address at Milwaukee, Wisconsin on um, October 14, 1912. Friends, I shall ask you to be as quiet as possible. I don't know whether you fully understand that I've just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. That's pretty cool. Good, good. Oh, Pop man. from the crowd right there. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Ow. <laughs> right? Fortunately, I had my, manus my, ma excuse me, my manuscript. So you see, I was going to make a long speech, and there is a bullet. This is where the bullet went through, and it probably saved me from it going into my heart. The bullet is in me now so that I cannot make a very long speech, but I will try my best. That's his opening. That's his opening to a crowd of supporters in Milwaukee. Oh, I tear through a fucking wall then to go and... and, and remember when Biden fell off the bike? Yeah. Yep. And everybody went fucking nuts? Uh -huh. Teddy Roosevelt got shot in the chest. He had it in his fucking... He's like, no, no, just put like some gauze on it. I'm going to go up there. That's not a shit on Biden. I'm just, and I'm going to shit on politics in a second. Later on, when Roosevelt finally received proper medical attention, the doctors determined that it would be more dangerous to attempt to remove the bullet than leave it in his chest. So Roosevelt carried it with him until he died. Wow. I wouldn't have guessed that. No. No. I feel like right? that would hurt. I feel like he'd feel it. Yeah. 
And remember, this happened during, I'm talking to the camera now, this happened during the 1912 presidential campaign. Why is that important? 1912 presidential campaign, Teddy Roosevelt was already president way before this. I'm going to explain and give you the timeline because I don't know if a lot of people remember this. Teddy Roosevelt was the 33rd <laughs> governor of New York from 1989 to 19, uh, from 1899 uh, to 1900. In late 1800s, Teddy Roosevelt was governor of New York. Okay? Then he served as vice president under President William McKinley from March to September of 1901. Andy, can you find out how long he was governor of New York, Teddy Roosevelt? I think I have it written down incorrectly. So he's governor of New York until 1900. Then he takes on and he becomes vice president under President William McKinley. William McKinley takes office in March, but only serves until 1901. What is it? March to September 1901. Uh, and as the 33rd governor of New York from 1899 to 1900. Okay, so, it really so one wasn't year. that long. Okay. Yeah. Oh, not at all. One year. And he I remember. Just, he might have just spent, he might have been just a couple of months, too, when you think it might not have been a whole 12 months. Right. He was, he was probably yeah. using it as a stepping stone. Yeah, yeah so he was using it as a stepping stone. And I what knew that he was because I remember. He was also a commissioner. Ke yeah, Caleb Carr wrote right. The Alienist. Correct. And it's historical fiction. I thought it was a very good book. And Teddy Roosevelt is prominent in it. Mm -hmm. Well, he was the commissioner of that at the time, of the right. place at the time. So this is, this is my whole point. Stay with me. Get a, <laughs> get a pencil and paper. 1912, this happens to uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He gets shot. Okay, but I'm telling you, 1899 to 1900, he's governor of New York City. Used to be the greatest city in the world. It's no longer. Then he served as vice president under William McKinley until 1901. McKinley, the 25th president of the United States, was assassinated on September 6, 1901, just six months into his term. So Teddy assumes the presidency immediately after McKinley's assassination and then served as the 26th president from 1901 to 1909 okay he was only 42 when he took the throne from mckinley so he remains the youngest person to become president of the united states at 42 jfk was 43 when he was elected he was the youngest person ever elected teddy was thrown into the office because mckinley was shot okay and now think of that Th think of a 42 year old bull moose leading us into a progressive era Think of a 43-year-old Kennedy, handsome Kennedy, unfortunately leaving the top up down at fucking uh, Dallas, okay? Again, compare it to today. The median age at inauguration for all U.S. presidents since George Washington is how old? Do you know? No idea. How, what, what's the average age of the president when they take office? And then this now is since then. Washington, since Washington, <laughs> all of them. What's the average median age? 64. 55 years old. 55 years old and maybe like 110 days. So it's not even 55 and a half. It's closer to 55. I'm rounding down. Fuck mm. you. 55 <laughs> years old. Trump was almost 71 and Biden was over 78. That's fucking wild when you think about that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. When Teddy Roosevelt took office, he was half of Biden's age. It, it blows my mind. And this isn't a political thing. I'm not saying get Biden out. Trump's a dick or anything. It's just, it's crazy. And I guess it's because young people can't put up with the screen. I, I have no I idea. I think uh, baby boomers, I mean, them being such a majority in the population, mm -hmm. they're going to tend to vote for people similar to them. I bet. So I, I feel like it's just like over time. I bet. I, Reagan was old, right? So yeah. we're going to yeah, go back to Reagan. He, everybody yeah. said that then, too. Well, he was the oldest, you know, before Trump. Right. Yeah, before Trump. I think it was Reagan, Trump, and then Biden. Um, does, you can check me on that. Does part. life expectancy have to something to do with it? I, mean, I assume a little bit because uh, people just didn't last as long back then. But 19, 1912, we're getting into the, the modern yeah, era, no, too. 100%. But, and I, I didn't believe 55. So I pulled out the chart, pulled it out. And all of a sudden, I'm looking down, and it does wind up making sense. Like, there, there, there is such a heavy... You know, concentration in the late 40s and 50s at one point, back when they had mustaches. And uh, so it does skew the thing. I don't think that we're ever going to have... I'm saying it right now. I don't know if we're ever going to have a 40-year-old... A president in his 40s ever again. I mean, do we, how old are the people are running? How old would be like a well, Ron DeSantis? Well, DeSantis is younger than me. I'm... What am I, 47, 48? What am I? You're 48. How, how, so how old I think is... he's younger than me. I feel like Ron DeSantis is. You know who really seems young and hip? Beto O'Rourke. Beto O'Rourke. He is. 
Uh, uh, I, th- I thought he was. Dead air is terrible, yeah, but I don't 44. care. He's 44. So he's 44. Yeah. So Ron DeSantis, that would be such a break from the fuck. Don't vote for Ron DeSantis because of me. We're just talking about age right now. We're just yeah, talking about age. I don't know who the Democratic Party would put up against I mean, him. Poop, but bo- Pete Buttigieg is 40. So he's someone in so he's young liberal, too. yeah. So in our next, so our next election is going to break this mold. Probably, I hope so. Right. I just don't think Biden's going to make it, like <laughs> li- physically. Uh, well, I think people. Life-wise. It's just strictly for the connect right. to pe- understand people. Just you know. Right. And I think it would eliminate the argument of age. Yeah. Annie, let me get to this. Sorry. So so <laughs> Teddy does almost all of McKinley's term, less six months. He gets reelected, serves a second term until 1909. Listen, when the elections are and when they're inaugurated, makes people say, wasn't it 1910? Wasn't it 1908? Just, you know, stay with me. Everyone knows. So he did three and a half years, then four years, okay? On the night of his, not re-election, because the only time he was elected, on the night of his election, Roosevelt publicly declared that he would not run for re-election after the second term, and a pledge he wound up regretting. But he felt bound by his word, and he believed that his Secretary of War, one of our favorite people in the world, William Howard Taft, was his logical successor. And with Roosevelt's help, again, the bull moose behind him, Taft had little opposition for the Republican nomination and then easily defeated William Jennings Bryant for the presidency in the 1909 election. Okay? What do we know about Taft? You guys remember? Everyone knows one thing about him. Stuck in the bathtub, but Stuck last bathtub. president to have a mustache. Damn though. fucking yeah. right. Damn right. <laughs> oh, any facial hair. Harrison, I think, was the last one to have a beard. Yeah. And Taft was the last one with a mustache. So any type of facial hair, that was Taft. But Taft's presidency wound up not being to Roosevelt's liking. So after four years off, Roosevelt took four years off, essentially, just steaming on how Taft wasn't doing what he thought he was going to do. He decided to run again. This is 1912. That's why this election was so interesting and important. The 22nd Amendment wasn't ratified until 1951 to limit presidential terms. This was years after the other Roosevelt, Teddy's distant cousin or whatever, FDR, ended his four-term run in 1945 when he died in office. FDR dies in office in 1945. In 1951, they ratified the 22nd Amendment to limit presidential terms. We're talking about 1912. Teddy can run as many fucking times as he wants, okay? But Taft already had the Republican nomination locked up. And Roosevelt did not want to run as a Democrat, obviously, so he and his followers formed something called the Progressive Party. That's eerily (laughs) similar to what looks like might happen this election, right? Because if DeSantis, this guy from Florida, takes the Republican, uh, Republican nomination a former president like Donald Trump could start the Trump party. Mm-hmm. Very good party. I, I'm doing good Trump. But I you know love what I mean? the party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good party. Best party. Um, so but that, yeah, and it, but yeah. that'll split the vote, right? Which is what happened It's exactly here. what happened in this yeah, fucking yeah. thing. Right? So there was a lot of shit going on in the 1912 election. And then to make it more interesting, Teddy gets shot. And here's where people are gentlemen. Both Taft, the Republican, and Democratic nominee, maybe you've heard of him, Woodrow Wilson, suspended their own campaigns until Roosevelt recovered and resumed his campaign trail. That's gentlemanly. That's why songs shot. were made so much yeah. better back then. Yeah. That's like the NFL, too, what they're doing, yes. you know, in deference to this gentleman who had got thoughts and prayers, obviously. Okay? But a week in Roosevelt, even when he came back, only made two more speeches in the campaign, and this is where Teddy Roosevelt's luck essentially runs out. Teddy won more votes and more electoral votes than Taft, the Republican, but Wilson bested both of them. And won the presidency. So he split that conservative Republican vote, and yeah. Wilson goes and takes it. All righty? So, am I done talking about Teddy Roosevelt and being assassinated? Not even fucking close. The guy who shot him, his name was John Schrenk. That's what I told you guys earlier. He claimed to have shot Roosevelt as a warning to other third-termers, potential third-termers, and that it was the ghost of William McKinley, The dude who got shot, who Teddy Roosevelt took over for, it was the ghost of William McKinley that told him to shoot Teddy Roosevelt. This would be huge for us in the fucking dozen. I think we would would now kill it. Absolutely. Where is the bullet that struck Teddy Roosevelt by John Schrenk? It's in Teddy Roosevelt's fucking coffin lodged in his rib. Yep. Right on. Yeah. Now they can't ask you. Would you like to give a promo for the dozen? 
With, yeah, with Gen X, Y, Z, we're, coming, we, we're we, coming for that ass. Do we do it over Joe Lewis? No. No, we don't do it over Joe no, Lewis. No, 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 no. And we don't do it over Richard Nixon. No. Oh, yeah, I'm reading a, I'm reading a book on Richard Nixon. That right. Was, Wait, you did ever. use Richard Nixon. We can still use it. Hey, if he goes to the well with John Mayer, it's, his, it's a milieu. I, I, I'm looking I, for different ones, though. Yeah, I'd like to get away from John Mayer. I, just, I don't want I don't to get wanna, away. You're okay. Money. Well, if we need it, I'll do it, obviously. Yes, but yes. I, I don't. I don't want to get pigeonholed. I'm more than that. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an artist. You know, I no, want something. I was like a top 10 Nietzsche guy. And I think it's because we haven't done a mayor four times or something. Yeah. I, something like that. Well, I, I just remember the time we did sandwiches. It's when we had oh, so many on, sandwiches, yeah. you were on yeah, that's right. fire. Yeah, it was no great. Yeah, it was on a team I like that. to think about those days sometimes. <laughs> so this guy shrank. On the anniversary of President McKinley's death, right? He has a dream. Just happens to be the anniversary of his death, so he's he's kind of into McKinley. He has a dream where the dead president is lying in his coffin. Suddenly, the corpse of McKinley. This reminds me of like a Japanese ghost toilet. I was about to say, yeah, yeah. Quick mission uh, expressway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you're all set. So McKinley rises and addresses Shrank, right? And he says, points. Shrank looks. There's a figure in a monk's robe. The guy pulls over the hood. It's Teddy Roosevelt in the monk's robe, right? None other than Teddy Roosevelt. Then dead President McKinley turned to face Shrank, stating, This is my murderer. Avenge my death. Shrank was never tried for the assassination. Instead, he was found to be insane. He was sentenced to the Central State Mental Hospital in Wapen, Wisconsin. Wapen, I think I got that right. W-A-U-P-U-N, Wisconsin. In 1914. And here's the thing. 1914, right? He does the assassination in 1912. He's found out to be... Uh, you know, mentally unstable, goes in 1914. He was not allowed to receive any visitors or communication from the outside world for the next 29 years until his death from natural causes in 1943. And that that's prison as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You get put, I, I don't like to say the nut house or anything like that, but you get put it away. I think it's different when, I mean, that's me, so, you know, maybe I'm softy, but if someone's mentally insane, yes, to keep them from visitors and stuff, I don't know. I, I think I think the worst thing that you can do to somebody. By the way, so I'm done with the assassination of Teddy Roosevelt. Worst thing you can do is not give them an outlet to talk about it, right? Especially with somebody from the outside. And you know what that would be a good segue into? BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. When you're at your best, you can nice. do great things. But sometimes life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed. Like you're not showing up the way that you want to be seen. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. Because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws you. Whether or not you've been in therapy personally, anybody here, I think it's something that you should consider. It's something that Annie and I have done. I've spoke about it. Have you been in therapy? Oh, yeah. You've yeah. done it, right? Yeah. I've done, nice I've done therapy. I've done better better help. Done better help. Yeah. So, I I mean, we talk about it all the time. It's something that we did, you know, briefly after 9-11. And, and it just helps. Just helps to kind of talk things out. And BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Entirely online. So if you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help you get there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Twisted and get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P. BetterHelp.com slash Twisted. 10% off your first month. And it's one of those things. You don't want to get up and go anywhere to do this shit, right? That, that was my favorite part is being in New York City. I just got here. I didn't know how to get around. Right. It's tough. And then all of a sudden you can uh, do it online. You don't have to actually see the person. You can cancel anytime you want. It's, it's very convenient. And I think you're sometimes even more, I don't know, honest with a therapist. If they're not really judging you in the same room, you know, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's like confession when you're behind the wall. Catholics yeah. going to confession. You can go behind yeah. the screen or talk to the priest. I went with my family for the first time. And as we were speaking about it going out, my, my family, Annie and the kids, because as the kids were doing their first confession, they all went behind the screen. And they were like, why are you in there for such a long time? I was like, fuck it. I go face to face. Yeah, you're like, in there go. for a long time. We talk. were always screened. Oh, were you? We would, we would, so we would line up in the pews and... You would never know which priest your side had, so right. it would always be a big reveal when you went in. You'd be like, "Oh yeah. shit!" Yeah. The whisk Father mouthing, behind yeah, the camera, Father D. Yeah. Um, but never get a hot 
therapist. I thought it'd be oh, I could do yes. it. I thought no, you just Never. You, you, yeah. you'd feel uncomfortable telling him what's up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd make a good or therapist. shameful. Yeah. Uh, BetterHelp.com slash twisted. To, no. Sorry, your wife's right there, large. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> um, all right, so so now Teddy Roosevelt. Do you think he he was lucky for that? You know why I think he might have been super lucky. Are, are you are you giving more away from the history of Teddy Roosevelt? This Just one more thing. Okay. He, guy died in his sleep. The last thing he oh, said man. was, "Please put out the light." And then he, you know, his, he had a heart attack and died oh, in his sleep. I, uh, mo- more That's unlucky. Funny. His, I believe it was. This isn't FDR. I believe it's Teddy. More unlucky. His uh, mom died. And then his wife yes. died like two hours later. Yes. And then in his journal, he wrote like, this is the darkest day of my yeah. life. That the journal entry has, I've seen. The light yes. has finally gone out the of my life. The light has finally gone out. Yeah. So, wow. and then there, he and then takes, his daughter's we're like, giving away it was too like, much for this fucking dozen match. Yeah. His yeah. daughter was wild. Like she was a wild child. He, the daughter that like, I guess the, maybe the wife died during birth. I think that might've been, I'm not he, uh, brushed up on it, but I think she, the wife died giving birth to Alice. Right. And, really? and was um, the youngest. Or she, uh, well, he because he got re- I believe he got remarried after that. I mean, I have to brush up okay. on a little bit, but um, like the daughter, like he never really interacted with her. Like she was, she was an absolute wild child because, you know, she didn't really have much guidance. The K- makes sense. Kermit, his son, he took to the Amazon, and that's where he almost mm-hmm. died in the Amazon. They you just told him to leave him there. Like I'm, I'm out, I'm, I'm done. I'm gonna die here. Right. And then. Uh, Giving away it's way too much. Yeah, true, true, true. I, I, Can I, I need to fill an hour and a half of Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> right? It's going to be awesome. I've mean, gone to the well so many times with Tsutomu Yamaguchi already. Last but even with, Vest, what's her name, Vesta? Vesta I can't. Bovich, yeah, yeah. I'm actually closing on something that I spoke about uh, also. For, very, very first president to leave the country while in office. Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Really? Panama. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He awesome. was a stud. Twisted history of Teddy Roosevelt's going to be a banger. I That's think. all I'm going to say. Appreciate Let's move on. Arthur John Priest. You don't know his name. I told you about Violet Jessup, and she survived three of those uh, those uh, boat capsizing, right? Arthur John Priest is the insinkable stoker. What's a stoker? So a stoker is one of these a people that stoker? works on yeah in the boiler room, in the engine room of uh, of ships. And if you look up pictures of stokers, they're typically like covered in soot. Mm-hmm. They usually work with their shirts off because yeah. they're down there just shoveling in. <laughs> they don't live very long uh-huh. because they're just sucking in. You know, like it's it's not good. It's like <laughs> no, working yeah. in a goddamn coal mine. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised they don't yeah. do it naked. Like, remember we saw them doing it naked in Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Oh, I finally watched Chernobyl. You like I thought it? Chernobyl was very good. It was, really good. Yeah. It Holy was shit! Excellent. I'm very it. well done. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the reasons why some the guy who did Chernobyl is doing something else that I think I'm going to do. I don't oh, know you mentioned that. I don't remember what what it was. Is it kaleidoscope or is it? Wasn't really a fan of that. Not gonna lie. I did. We just started it. Don't don't say anything. Not I can't get through it. a full episode without falling yeah, asleep. Falling I asleep. like it though. That's the weird thing. So I don't know what it is that's. Me. Yeah. The They're shaking spot. on any order, but they put us in an order. I, yeah, I I just think that part of it is gimmicky. Like I think it would have been a better show if it was just in an order. Yeah. yeah. So I the hair's throwing yeah. him off. I'm like, wait, that's the same person. He's like, no, it's not this. So. Yeah, I think yeah. I'm out on it too. Arthur John Priest. <laughs> He's a stoker. Yeah. They call him the unsinkable stoker. He was an English fireman and stoker who is notable for surviving four ship sinkings. So he said, Violet Jessup, you can't hold my fucking jock. He was on the Titanic. You guys know what happened to that. It hit an iceberg. All that happened to Arthur John Priest was that he had frostbite on his toes. He was on the Alcantara. That was sunk in combat in 1916. It was one of those cruise ships that was then brought in to be a warship, and it was sunk. Arthur John Priest was on it. He was on the Britannic. We know that that was sunk by a mine. And he was on the SS Donegal, which was torpedoed in World War I. And then he was also on two other ships that had collisions while he was on them that didn't sink. After the sinking of the SS Donegal, Priest retired as a stoker. He claimed that no one wished to sail with him after all those disasters. So if you're going to remember Violet Jessup, also remember Arthur John Priest, the unsinkable stoker. And if you want to remember one other thing about him, he died at the age of 49 from pneumonia, and his whore wife Annie <laughs> wound up marrying his brother after he died. Oh, oh, the unsinkable stoker? She does that to him? Fucking I, those are tough shoes to fill, though. Yeah, I yeah. guess his brother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sounds like a Biden. We'll go what? to a musician. <laughs> we'll go to musicians, particularly for a band. Were you in a band? No. 
No. Nah. No, you were a runner. Yeah. And you yeah. never in a band, right? You, you only play. Me? No. Yeah. yeah. I spit some bars. Really? <laughs> yeah. And he's yeah. great Wood on dog. the piano. <laughs> right? But. but. She sucks on the organ. For musicians, <laughs> there's a guy named Adolf Sax. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> he was a Belgian musician, and he was the inventor of the saxophone. I didn't know that. I thought the saxophone was named after some Latin prefix. Sax. Yeah, like, I love this story. Yeah, yeah. So this guy's name is Adolf. It's A-D-O-L-P-H with an E. So I'm going to call it Adolf as opposed to Adolf. And his last name was Sax. And so he made the saxophone. It's a pretty big deal. Compared to the, it's not as good as the sax boom as we sax know. Sax boom, yeah. Uh, that's uh, Jack Black. His father and mother were also instrument designers who made several changes to the design of the French horn. It was said that one of his ancestors was tapped by William I of Orange, a.k.a. William the Silent, to create instruments for the Belgian military. If somebody wants to research this, please do. But for some reason, Adolf Sax and William I of Orange show up together in the same timeline. If I'm not sure about that, why would I put that in here? And the reason I put that in here is because I'm going on a left turn. I love William the Silence fucking story. I love William the Silence story. Little tidbit on him. He was the first head of state in recorded history to be assassinated by handgun. We just spoke about Teddy Roosevelt. This guy was the first one. Guy came in with two handguns, 1584. That's why the sax thing doesn't so doesn't like link up because sax isn't until early 1800s. So at this guy, William the Silent, is the first guy to be assassinated as a head of state by handguns. <laughs> Gets shot in the chest with two primitive handguns in 1584. So he's not so lucky. He shouldn't be in the uh, in the luck thing. But even less lucky was the poor son of a bitch who shot him. This guy's <laughs> name was Balthazar Girard. Okay? Remember this name, Balthazar Girard. He was caught after shooting this Dutch nobleman, and he was imprisoned. So this is what happened to Balthasar Girard. We talk about torture all the time, Jeff. Yep. We kind of like it. We like talking about torture. Love Would it. Would you agree with I, that? I'd love it, yeah. I'm telling you right now, if this isn't the most brutal torture story, and we've done the ones with the thing in the perineum, the fucking brazen bull, all that. He was tortured before his trial where he was sentenced to an execution that was also fucking brutal. I'm going to go through both. I'm starting with the torture before the trial. It's bullet points. On the first night of his imprisonment, Gerard, Balthazar Gerard, was hung on a pole and lashed with a whip. Okay, that's what should happen, right? They hang you on a pole, they lash you with a whip. Next, his wounds were smeared with honey, and a goat was brought to lick the honey off his skin, but the goat had an abnormally rough tongue. That's why they did it. That's getting a little more specific, but Mm -hmm. still. Goats have rough tongues. We've seen cheetah tongues. We know that this happens. It's not overly weird or overly brutal. Just wait. It has a really rough tongue. Yes. That's a weird thing to yeah. think about, right? Bring us the goat with – and it must like the goat must came out. He must constantly like be like that, yeah. right? You know what I mean? Three, he was left to spend the night with his hands and feet bound together like a ball. So sleep would be difficult. Again, whipping, goat licking, and uncomfortable sleep. Nobody would sign up for it, but, but not the worst that we've heard of. During the following three days, he was repeatedly mocked and hung on this pole with his hands tied behind his back. And here's where we get very specific. Then a weight of 300 pounds, about me, was attached to each of his big toes for a half hour. Again, very specific. I don't know if they had some sort of hourglass for a half hour where they put a weight that looked like me on his big toes. And I don't even know the physics of it. Mm -hmm. But that's very, very specific. Then Gerard was fitted with shoes made of well-oiled but uncured dog skin. The shoes were two inches shorter than his feet. And in this state, with, with I don't know, with, with uncomfortable shoes, he was put before a fire. When the shoes warmed up, they contracted, contracted, causing the feet inside of them to be crushed into stumps. Again, this is pretty specific. When the shoes were removed... His half-broiled skin off his feet was then torn off. After his feet were damaged, I don't even know what number I'm up to, his armpits were branded. I've never heard of that. I've never heard of branding of the armpits. Mm -mm. Are we getting specific here, right? Oh, yeah. After that, he was then dressed in a shirt soaked with alcohol. 
Oh, right? Because oh. that's the only way you really get it into your armpits. Probably yeah. a tight shirt. I don't even like tight shirts. Mm. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Lastly, <laughs> burning bacon fat was poured over him and sharp nails were stuck between the flesh and the nails of all of his fingers and toes. Mm. That's before he went to trial. Oh. This poor bastard. Right? What's his name again? Balthazar? Balthazar Girard. Then came the trial and the sentencing where the magistrates decreed, and again, this is very specific. This is how I'm going to go bullets again. One, <laughs> the right hand of Girard should be burned off with a red hot iron. Okay? That his flesh should be torn from his bones with pincers in six different places. I don't know what the six places are. I've already written too much on this. It's like throwing darts at a dart, but you just kind of, yeah, wherever. Yeah, six places. You know, get him in that armpit, the one that we had already, then go by the stump and blah, blah, blah. Then he should be quartered and disemboweled while alive. And that his heart should be torn from his chest and flung in his face. <laughs> Let's insult to injury. And then finally... <laughs> His head should be cut off. Woof. Oh, my God. That's Balthasar Girard, the guy who killed William the Silent, first time anyone's ever been killed with guns. The first time a elected official was ever killed with guns in recorded history. I don't even know why I brought him up. Like, again, he may or may not have... he. So the guy that tortured... So the tortured guy that assassinated someone may have appointed... Adolf Saxes, the inventor of the saxophone, um, may have appointed someone in his family tree with making instruments. And that skill transferred to Saxes' early 1800s childhood, which he used to perfect an already popular instrument like the clarinet, and he created the saxophone. I think it was his dad. I think he num it was his But how could it be his dad if it's 1584 to 1800s? His dad couldn't have lasted 100 no, yeah. years. I think it, you know, it trickles down. No. No, this guy was dead in 1584. I know, I like, that's my whole deal. Dead. Like, if somebody can give me that time, like, his dad's name is totally different. Like, it, so Adolf Sachs also went by Antoine Joseph Sachs or something like that. And I think that's where it gets a little bit fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Don't let me get into this thing now because you're saying, <laughs> all right, Large, now you're taking us down torture, even though you know the Vibs mm -hmm. does it. You're taking us to the guy who invented the saxophone. This is a twisted history of luck. Why is Adolf Sachs or Adolf Sachs even on this list? All right. So while his family was known best for the contributions to musical history, what many don't know about Adolf is how he escaped death. Again, I think a list is going to work best. As a kid, he was listed chronically accident prone. He was one of 11 children in his family to make it to puberty. He was the only one. One of 11. Only one who survived to puberty. That's yeah. lucky. As a toddler, he fell the height of three floors, over 30 feet, before hitting his head on a rock and was initially believed to be dead, but survived. That's lucky. At three years old, he drank a bowl on accident of sulfuric acid, thinking it was milk, and he survived. That's lucky. He once swallowed a knitting needle, which was pretty big, and he passed it, shit it out, without any injuries. That's lucky. He also endured serious burns from a gunpowder explosion, and once took a searing hot cast iron frying pan to the face. That's lucky. Three times he almost suffocated in his sleep from heavy varnish fumes because he's working around all these instruments. That's lucky. A falling cobblestone hit him in the head, which caused him to fall in the river and nearly drown, but he was rescued. That's lucky. So when you look up the guy who created the saxophone, you're going to hear all about shit that happened to him. And he's a very, very interesting life, but he was also one of the luckiest kids <coughs> alive. Sax's mother, Marie, noticed the pattern and quoted it as saying, He's a child condemned to misfortune. He won't live. But she was wrong. He lived to the age of 79. So all that is lucky. However, he died penniless because counterfeiters were ripping off the saxophone with cheap imitations. There were so many lawsuits against him as he tried to file patents for this. And the saxophone really didn't come into favor until after his death. So whenever you see Kenny G... And that weapon of harmony that he has, right? Mm -hmm. That fucking axe of his. Know that the story behind his is Adolf Sachs, or Adolf Sachs, who is one of the luckiest men alive. When And may or may not be related to a, a pretty good torture story. When Bill Clinton busted his saxophone out, mm. was America just like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, a president playing the saxophone? Is he synonymous with the sax? 
I would say think, so. I, I couldn't Bill think Clinton. of anyone other than, than <laughs> Kenny G, and now I'm, I feel um, stupid I didn't think of Bill Clinton. Yeah, I, I think the Simpsons helped make him, oh. like, because I've seen him. That's the only really reason I know he plays a saxophone. And Lisa plays it. Yeah, 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 yeah. and they, and they, yeah. Right. I should have thought of Clinton. Ah, but was so it cool where people were like, this is awesome. Oh, they uh, loved yeah. it. Claren- oh. Clarence Clemens, I would say, too. With Bruce. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, rest in power. Yeah, <laughs> rest in power. <laughs> but Clinton came out, he had on, like, he actually had on, like, a cheap pair, like, almost like those glasses that they give out at weddings. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they sometimes eight. they have, like, the, the neon green, like, arms to mm-hmm. them. So he had that. He did it on, like, Arsenio or something. And yeah. people lost mm-hmm. their mind. It wasn't a dry panty in the, in the United States. Damn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Another lucky guy, and I think a guy who's not necessarily a household name, but he's pretty close to it. Do you know the story about Furio from The Sopranos? Do you know the story? Like the plot? No, oh. like other than him being Furio from The Sopranos, the actor. I do, not. do you remember who Furio was? Yeah. He Furio. had like a. I don't know his name. He had but a big I... Roman nose. He yeah. was the hitman. Kind he used to of. wear the. Uh, I seen it. Yep. He used oh, to, you haven't? Nope. He used to wear the um, Speedos walking you, around Carmella. <laughs> you will love yeah. his character. Furio. Okay. He was brought over from, like, the old country, <laughs> yeah. and he was just, like, a no-nonsense hitman. Love that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, pull back hair, right? He looked right? like Fabio. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Remember when he got hit in the face by all the seagulls? Yes, Fabio. <laughs> On the roller coaster? Yeah. The roller coaster. The guy who plays Furio. It? it was like Chariots of Fire or something, right? Yeah, yeah it was something. Yeah. Yeah. And then he said blood all over. Well, he had, <laughs> no, everyone off. dressed with them was dressed like well, Amazon. No, they were girls. Yeah, yeah they were the they were Amazon like, women, right? Yeah, like ISIS and stuff. Not ISIS. Yeah. <laughs> it was when the ride first opened where he went like it was close. <laughs> dressed like Al-Qaeda. Philadelphia. <laughs> no, they were all dressed like Diana on the, on the Isle of Lesbos. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, but it was, I'm, I can't help it. You brought up. Let me finish this. I only have 15 <laughs> left on my fucking. I apologize. Uh, so the guy who played Furio from The Sopranos, his name was Federico Castelluccio. <laughs> Great name. Winds up on, on top of being a actor. He's also an artist. He actually sold like a painting um, that looked like it was done like you know way back in the day, pre-Raphaelite type bullshit of Tony looking at Carmela, and he did it in like a triptych type uh, thing. A triptych frame where they're looking at each other wearing like very like regal gowns and shit like that. It's pretty cool. So he's an artist, he's an art historian, and he's an art dealer. I didn't know this about the guy. Federico Castelluccio. While he is in Germany with his girlfriend. Well, I'm assuming was hot. I would see that guy's having the hottest balls girlfriend. You don't you I'm sorry you don't have any kind of contact with this. I apologize. I feel like anybody on the cast of the Sopranos when it was like in a Tay Day yeah. was, was Poland. Yeah. They were just Pulling, pulling in some pulling. Yeah, that's it. Are you refusing to watch the Sopranos? Are you? No, uh, I I, I need to watch to, it. You're I, going to. I had a choice well, one time. Don't. I had enough time. That, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. It was it was Wire or Sopranos, and I went Wire. I, I don't, I'll, I'll I don't get the Sopranos. Wire I'll get great. there. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll get the Sopranos. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, I didn't really. know if it was like you were protesting. No, like some no. people are like, I'm not watching that. No, I need to. That's my number one all time. Wire? No, Sopranos. Sopranos. Like a commitment. Can't get past the ending. I actually love the ending. Yeah, so did my son. I don't, oh, I we're gonna like have it. to. Yeah, you know that's that. Your former that, son. Uh, <laughs> now, after he didn't like the ending, you were, you, were, you were not my son. Yeah. So anyway, so this guy, this guy is a stud. Okay, he's in Germany with his girlfriend. His girlfriend's wearing like a tiny thong. I don't know. So they're in Germany. Yeah. They're walking by what they thought was an antique shop. So they walk in. It winds up. It was a. Uh, it was an auction house. It was an art auction house. So he goes, he starts looking at the paintings. Literally, there's like four or five paintings leaned up against a wall. He starts thumbing through and he sees one. He's like, oh my God, this is a very old painting. He asks the guy and the guy says, yeah, that's an 18th century painting, whatever. He knows in his mind, this is a 17th century painting. He found a 17th century masterpiece by Guarcino, Guarcino that beautifully depicted the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. The, the, the auction house had misestimated it as an 18th century work. So this is what this shifty little Italian guy did. So he bids. He bids on this picture. And he acquires it for around $68,000. $68,000. Nobody else was coming close to him. Like, it was one of those things. Hey, I'm a lamb, I'm a thousand, I'm a thousand. thousand. He was like, 20,000. And everyone's like, what? All right, 25. 40,000. So he goes up to 68,000, blows everybody away, gets it comfortably. When all the additional costs are taken into account, shipping, restoration charges, bunch of add-ons that you do when you're restoring art, I don't know, a frame, it probably cost him about double, maybe $140,000 to get this thing out of Germany, you know, shipping taxes on artwork and all that stuff. So he's 140000 invested into the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. 
the painting was valued at $10 million. That's fucking lucky. Good for that guy. I feel good about that's him. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's in awesome. the lottery. Yeah. The real life, anti- like in person antiques roadshow. Yeah, Great exactly. Show. Yeah. Oh, like, show is cool. When those guys hit home something. runs, I feel so good for them mm-hmm. all, all the time. Because it's always someone, you know, whose like grandmother left it behind a butter churner. Yeah yeah. 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 I tell you what, that's for the people who don't understand, which I could never, I don't understand them. Say, what does the phrase spend money to make money mean? That's what that means. Yeah. Yeah, if you oh, have yeah. something quality, like I don't know what I'm gonna leave my kids, but like you know, like honestly, like <laughs> I'm not gonna leave them much. No, but I'm saying like, what? Like I don't like I'll, I'll leave Vic a Rolex or something like that. Mm-hmm. I, like it's not something that's purchased now, particularly when you can buy a really good brick watch. That's right. <laughs> All right, so go to uh, from Furio to a scumbag, Fidel Castro, communist leader of Cuba from 1959 to 2008. He died in 2016. Good riddance. Okay. In 2006, the former chief of Cuba's counterintelligence stated that there had been 634 assassination attempts on Fidel Castro's life. 634. That's a big number. You survive, he survived them all. He wasn't dead by assassination. He survived them all. That's a lucky son of a bitch. You know what the big important part of it is? A lot of it was done by the CIA. A lot of it was done by the mafia, right? Like there was a bunch of CIA of records that were then released years later and we saw just it was called operation mongoose yeah they tried to do all these like insane they tried to get too cute with it i think they could have just to, they put explosives in a cigar right right they uh they uh, a shitload of stuff where they were trying to poison him it, it, including inside he used to scuba dive which is funny to me to think of like you know <laughs> somewhere yeah he's, yeah, just, yeah he's yeah so they 20, put twenty thousand leagues under tubercul basili in his scuba diving suit and they also booby trapped the conch placed on the sea bottom of where he normally. That's that's wacky shit. Yeah, right? uh, none yeah. of it worked. No. Yeah, <laughs> mafia Just... style execution attempts. None of it. There were plans to blow up Castro during his visit to Ernest Hemingway's museum in Cuba. Castro once said in regards to the numerous attempts, "If surviving assassination attempts were an Olympic event, I would win all the gold medals." That's pretty cool. And, there, and so if you don't believe me, obviously you don't need to believe me. There's a U.K. documentary about it called 638 Ways to Kill Castro. Mm-hmm. It's from 2006, and it tells in detail the story of some of the numerous attempts on Castro's uh, Fidel Castro's life. I'll be that's watching lucky. that. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool, that's, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't – it seems like it should have been a lot easier to kill Castro, but it was – I would think so. I think I could get him with a, uh, with a, with a high-powered slingshot. Yeah, Cuba's not that big. It's It's – doesn't have that big of a military. Right. Mm. I always do something Japanese, right? Nichiren was a prominent 12th century Japanese Buddhist priest. So we're going 12th century now, way back. He was sentenced to execution for writing a prophecy that Japanese authorities felt was sub- uh, was subversive. So a big no-no. No es bueno. Um, as pure luck would have it, Nichiren managed to escape his own beheading when the executioner pulled back on his sword and as he had it above his head he was struck by lightning <laughs> that's cool right it must have been fun to watch yeah i, I, I mean w- not, not fun but you know like, yeah yeah <laughs> what? it's probably bullshit oh uh, like this is a 12th century japanese buddhist priest and philosopher who was sent to execution maybe there was like a um i don't know like maybe there was he an had a heart or no. something like that like something magical or you know but they say, like the legend is, the guy went back. He got hit by lightning. I like that story. If, if that happened, yeah, I would be. I would have be convinced that I'm a god. Like I'm like, yeah, there's yeah, no yeah. doubt that I'm a god. I have power. I'm better than all these people. From today For going forward, reason, I will be known though, as Thor. He was. <laughs> yes. He was summoned. He was sentenced to be executed, and that was then canceled. And instead, he was uh, exiled to some place called Sado, S A D O Island, and that's where he spent the rest of his life in exile in a remote Sado Island. So that's something small in Japanese. How adorable. I have more Japanese stuff coming up. As a matter of fact, right here, 1938, I love this guy. You're 18 years old, okay? You're living in Korea. It's 1938, and your name is Yang King Jong, okay? I have told you about Korea on a couple of occasions when we spoke about Korea, how it has changed hands a bunch of times. At one point, part or all of Korea was run by the Japanese in 1938, that was the case. So the Japanese conscripted this Korean boy, 18-year-old Yang Kyung Jung. They conscripted him, drafted him into the Japanese army. Okay? And Yang was sent... 
to the Kwangtung Army in Manchuria, northeast China. Okay? A year later, he was fighting the Russians in the Battle of Kalkin Gol and was captured as a prisoner of war. So he's minding his business in Korea. The Japanese take him. They move him to China. They train him. They send him to war against the Russians. 1938, the Russians were on our side. So it's good guys, Germany, Russians, Japan. So he goes, Rus uh, he goes west and starts fighting the Russians. Okay? He spends a few years stuck in a Soviet labor camp, and in 1942, Russia became so desperate for soldiers that they began conscripting prisoners. Yang was one of them. So for the second time, he was recruited into a fight that was never his. He was sent west again to fight for the Russians against Germany in the Battle of Kharkov in Ukraine, where he was captured as a prisoner of war once again by the Nazis. So if there's one thing you know about this guy Yang, he was terrible at war, right? He was terrible at war, and he's still being moved west. In 1944, the Germans had to, cons had to get prisoners to get them to fight for him so once again he was conscripted into the german army transported even further west to france where he posted to defend the port of cherbourg in normandy on d-day holy shit so now he's fighting for the nazis against the english french and americans okay and we know that the allies successfully took the beaches because we all watch band of brothers and yang was captured once again he sucks this time by the british forces he spent some time in an English prisoner of war camp before being sent to a camp in the United States. They couldn't have moved this fucking kid further away from yeah. Korea, right? Yeah. So an 18-year-old kid, uh, Japan, Russia, Nazi Germany, fucking Normandy, England, and now he's in the U.S. as a prisoner of war. Once the war was over and Yang was no longer a prisoner, he decided to stay in the United States, becoming a citizen and living out the rest of his yeah, life there best until country he died. In the world. Yeah. Fuck he yeah. died in Illinois in 1992, and he was Carl from Chicago, his <laughs> baseball coach. And that's not true at all, but that's the only way I can get you to remember things. So that, that's the story of fucking Yang Kyung Jong thing. That's, that's fascinating. Is that, and that's lucky. He should have been killed by the Russians, should have been killed by the Nazis, should have been killed by us, and he probably should have been killed by Carl. But the guy made it through the whole thing. I know. I know. Back in like uh, like Roman times and stuff, they'd conscript people and yeah. whoever was paying the most, they'd fight for them. It kind of seems like uh, it's that style of mercenary. Where they're like, oh, we you need think soldiers. It was a Let's piece of shit, though. I conscript you to fight for Japan. I'm Japanese. You're Korean, mm -hmm. obviously. Do you just like kind of go through the motions? Do you almost just, like, give up? It's fake. It's kind of like, uh, but you're trying to, yeah, I don't know. Like, you want to stay alive. You just want to stay seated. Go under the radar as much as possible. Right. But we just did the Twisted History last week where they were talking about the Russians where they instilled the rule that was if you retreat, you get shot. Right. So if you're in fighting for Russia, you're screwed. You got right. to look like you're trying. But that's why I'd run across no man's land. No, no. I'd run across naked. Yeah. Take me. I, that, you know what I mean? That was another thing. I was, if, if you're, I don't know, like a... If you're an Asian dude and you're and you're fighting for Russia, couldn't you be like, yeah, no, I'm not. I, I swear to God, I'm not. Yeah, exactly. Not me. Look, obviously. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, be like me fighting for Kenya. I'd be like, come on. Yeah. He's like a, he's like a, a wayward man in like a, a league, like just bouncing yeah. around from team to team. Yeah, he's a journeyman. He's like, yeah, no. yeah, journeyman. Let's look at uh, good luck charms. I didn't okay. bring my ring. I have a I have a horseshoe ring. I wear whenever I, I gamble. Uh, good luck charm, amulet, or other item that's believed to bring good luck. Almost any object can be used. Uh, the one most popular for me growing up with a bullet, because my parents are both filthy mix, uh, was the four-leaf clover. Right? Thought to be rare. You can actually uh, cultivate four-leaf clovers where they're not that rare. But if it's a field of wild clover, it says one in every 5,000 has four leaves. So it is kind of rare. and. So it's good luck, okay? A description from 1869 says that four-leaf clovers were gathered at night by sorceresses while young girls, in search of a token of perfect happiness, made the quest of the plant by day. So witches at night, bitches during the day. I just made that up. Uh, in 1877, in St. Nicholas Magazine, a letter from an 11-year-old girl wrote, wrote, Did fairies ever whisper in your ear that a four-leaf clover brought good luck to the finder? So there's all this stuff floating around on why four-leaf clovers are lucky. The traditional three-leaf shamrock 
and shamrocks and clovers are basically interchangeable, right? A shamrock's type of a clover. Um, they use the three-leaf clover in the story of St. Patrick to explain the Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Whereas the four-leaf clover, they attribute to uh, Christians to represent hope, faith, love, and luck. So that's why I brought it up, right? So four-leaf clovers. The number seven. So four-leaf clovers, do you believe in that shit? Or did uh, you have no, it? No, no, not really. No? I used to have a lucky rabbit's foot. I'm going to get to rabbit's feet. A bunch of them. Rabbit's yeah. feet are fucking weird. Do you have oh. anything weird? What are you again? I'm Irish and Portuguese. So, Portuguese. So clovers, uh, more so the Irish side with this, I think four-leaf clovers have always kind of been a right. thing of luck, for sure. What's the luckiest thing that ever happened to you? Oh, I don't know. I, I get typically that I'm just very lucky in general. Okay. Like, all my friends just say, like, we want to go out with you tonight for sure because, like, you have the best luck out. And I don't really know Seven. what that means, Seven. but okay. I think things just to tend to, like, fall into place fall into place perfectly for me, like, all the time. Um, and then I hit, like, massive parlays, like, way too frequently. Do you really? So this summer, I think they posted on the sports book, but I hit an 11-leg UFC parlay on straight winners really in one night and I literally just put a dollar on it very responsible gambling yeah. but uh i did it because i just based it off of the cooler name really i was like this guy sounds like a badass this dude sounds like a badass and went down the list that's big Nailed you it. know on twisted history we have a um historic we, we historically kill things so you may not want to yeah, talk about the luck too much yeah oh, by the way we mentioned no, 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 to, no, i'm here to freshen the vibes so, so lucky somewhere. we mentioned barbara walters we did mention her yeah. i didn't think we did Beauty pageants Barbara Walters, I think, was in a beauty. Yeah, pack. but that was a while ago. Yeah, okay. That was too many episodes. That doesn't count. I looked Stolen at that. Valor? How was luckiest you ever been? Uh, so I, I'm shooting around on the basketball goal in my cul-de-sac, my 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 hometown, yeah. and uh, I'm driving into the lane, and all of a sudden the ball bounces off my foot. I, I go for it, but the the goal fell down as I'm doing it. The the oh. basketball goal collapsed. Oh, the whole, and if I did if, if I wasn't such a shitty dribbler, it's either luck or I'm a shitty dribbler. I would have been just clocked really? in the head and just out. That's fucking big. Yeah, so that was, that was very lucky. And I think about that still to this, like, every yeah, once really? in a while. Yeah. Come up? It's like, if I didn't dribble off my foot, I'd be dead right now. Any? I, I think I should know yours, right? Mine is, like, probably... So, on 9-11, I was supposed to be at breakfast that morning. Right. Jeez. And I, uh, yeah, the, 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 we were at the Auburn Ole Miss game that weekend, and we parted a little too hard, and I broke my tooth on Monday. And I called my dad. I said, I'm not going to breakfast tomorrow. And, uh... Right. Yeah. So wow. I'd, I'd say yeah. that. Yeah, that's my luckiest too. Um, all right, so let's go around the world. Uh, number seven is considered lucky in Western culture. There's seven colors in the rainbow. Roy G. Biff, right? Seven continents, seven seas, seven days of creation, leaving to the seventh day or the Sabbath. Seven trumpets played by seven priests for seven days to bring down the walls of Jericho. There were seven dwarfs. A touchdown plus the extra point is worth seven. And this is my favorite. The number of spots most commonly found on ladybugs is seven. Seven is a lucky number, but but in Vietnam, it's considered unlucky. Granted, Vietnamese are incredibly superstitious. They prefer the numbers eight and nine for some reason in Vietnam, but they also um, leave a line of salt across their doorway if they feel like uh, there's wayward spirits following them. I love that type of shit. And they also believe whistling at night uh, attracts snakes. Yeah, yeah, so. But uh, bamboo in China. Bamboo. In the Chinese culture, the bamboo, the plum blossom, these are the big four. The bamboo, the plum blossom, the orchid, and the chrysanthemum are known as the four gentlemen. I love that. For their symbolism of uprightness, purity, humility, and perseverance against harsh conditions, among other virtues. But the rarity of its blossoming, like, so if you see bamboo, you very rarely see bamboo flowers. Some bamboo strains are only flower once every 50 years bamboo flowers even though bamboo is one of the four gentlemen bamboo flowers are regarded as a sign of impending famine and or doom because rats feed upon this rare profusion of flowers then multiply and then destroy a large part of the local food supply so bamboo goes both ways a chimney sweep which is worse than a stoker mm -hmm. chimney sweeps Back in the day, like obviously getting creosote and soot out of chimneys. I don't know why I'm doing this. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get it, yeah. Uh, watch on YouTube. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of kids that used to be brought into that, and they got small bodies, yeah, small little, bodies little hands. climb yep. up, 
And when you see some of these kids getting stuck in these uh, chimneys, it's absolutely terrifying. And again, black faces, lungs were just fucking terrible. Chimney sweeps, not a cool thing. Dirty, unhealthy, but it's filled with good luck. In like Great Mary Britain, Poppins. Yes, exactly. Uh, like a charming or- chimney sweep. Hello, Mary. It, Great Britain, it's considered lucky for a bride to see a chimney sweep on her wedding day. And many modern British sweeps hire th- themselves out to even just walk by weddings, much less attend a wedding. That's kind of cool. In Germany, Poland, Hungary, Croatia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Romania, and Estonia, chimney sweeps still wear the traditional all-black uniform with a black or white hat. It's considered good luck to grasp one of your buttons if you pass one in the street. <laughs> That's a good thing to know. If you Remember see a chimney that. Sweep? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's cool. As a lucky symbol, depiction of chimney sweeps are popular New Year's Day gift in Germany, either as small ornaments attached to flower bouquets or candy, like a marzipan-shaped chimney sweep. <laughs> Their traditional uniform is an all-black suit, golden jacket buttons, and a black top hat. So in Germany, chimney sweeps, you kind of get a chimney sweep cookie uh, on New Year's Day, like Italians do lentils and whatnot. In Italy... The Corno Porta Fortuna. Do you guys ever see the little chili pepper that, that Italians wear around their, their, their necks? Yep. Yeah, I, yeah, I know what you're talking the about. Italian yes. horn. Yeah. yeah, so that's actually a horn. It's oh. the Corno Porta Fortuna. And it literally means the little horn that brings luck. It's the Italian horn. We have two on our Christmas tree because Annie's half Italian. It's worn to protect against the evil eye, the Maloikia, and bad luck in general. And historically, it's to promote fertility and virility which would be the name of our doo-wop group if we ever got back together, <laughs> Fertility and Virility. So related to the corno is also this, the mano cornuta, the horned hand. So the mano cornuta is an Italian it. hand gesture. you got to accompany it with the... Yeah, yeah. So to ward off the maloikia, the evil eye, the yeah. mano means uh, hand and corno means horn. So the gesture is performed with the hand leveled or pointing down, or at least slightly downward, usually with a swiveling or oscillating motion. And you have to bite your bottom lip. Yeah, yeah, I guess. So the corno porta fortuna is the Italian horn. Sometimes it's called the cornito. And then the mano cornuta is the horn hand. I love Italians. I, I didn't know that little chili pepper thing. Man. I, yeah, thought bi- I thought pepper, bitches right? just love chili yeah. peppers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why they color it red. I should have looked up why they color it red because it does make it look like a, you know, a Serrano. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I mentioned ladybugs before. Some believe that if a ladybug lands on you, you should count the number of spots. It should be seven to predict how many years of good luck you'll have. Others think the spots indicate the number of months until your greatest wish comes true. That's the whole thing. You know who thought of that? Big farming thought of that. Ladybugs are excellent for crops because they eat aphids and other things that damage crops. So farmers thought this up. That way kids wouldn't go along and fucking kill them. They thought of this whole thing. It's bad luck to kill a ladybug and you're going to get seven months of good luck and that's it. So they, it's a big farm type thing. Kill ladybugs They just you die want. in your basement windowsill instead. <laughs> yeah. Just by, in piles. I don't know if anyone else... Horseshoe. Why is it red? Do you know? Yeah, I got the full thing here. So during ancient times, the horn was used as a votive offering to the goddesses Venus and Luna. The red coral often used to make the charm is sacred to Venus, goddess of love, and silver is sacred to Luna, the goddess of the moon. And then the red color and the phallic shape are also related to the male fertility god Priapus. Oh, yeah, Priapus, which is, yeah. yeah. So uh, so it kind of looks like a big red dick. I get it. Horseshoes. Horseshoes. Long been considered lucky. They're originally made of iron, a material that was believed to ward off spirits. They were traditionally held in place with seven nails, seven being the luckiest number, right? The superstition may have started due to a legend surrounding a 10th century saint named Dunstan, who worked as a blacksmith before becoming Archbishop of Canterbury. So Dunstan is in his black ship uh, shop. The devil comes in and the devil says, I need a horseshoe for my horse. Dunstan pretends not to recognize the devil, says, all right. Then he goes and grabs his hammer and horseshoe, and he grabs the devil's foot, and he hammers a horseshoe into the devil's foot, causing him some great pain. Dunstan eventually agreed to remove the shoe from the devil, but only after extracting a promise that the devil would never enter a household with a horseshoe nailed to the door. That's where that shit came about. And now people are divided on which way the horseshoe should be nailed. 
When I wear my horseshoe ring, I wear it this way so I catch all the good luck. It stays as opposed to falling it out if the horseshoe is pointed down. But, and that's what people believe. But wouldn't you want the luck shooting out into whatever hand you have? Yeah, or whatever? And then when I go to roll, I turn the shit over. Oh. See, that's what I'm saying. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. You don't want that luck to spill out. I don't know. That's So that's the whole thing. Many say that the end, so when people have horseshoes up above their uh, their doors, people say have the ends facing up. That way it catches all the luck, right? The ends pointing down would have the good luck to be lost. But others say that it should point down so the luck is poured upon the people entering the home. I'm torn upon it, but I like it better when well, it's up. I think up. when you lift a horse's keep foot, up. it's up. Keep them up. <laughs> when you lift a horse's foot, they're up. Yeah. Let's keep going. Uh, the Manico Nico. Have you ever heard... The Manikai Nico, it's a cat. They're always in like the, the uh, front of like Chinese food yeah, restaurants. Yeah, we, yeah. You've seen those, right? Yes. Yeah. I was, I, usually, usually it's a bobblehead. You'll tell me what it's they are. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a bobblehead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's got the arm that goes it's like this. It's constantly going, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's called a Maniki. <laughs> so, so far I've said it three times, and I've said it uh, different all three times. A Maniki Nico. It's a Japanese figurine, which is believed to bring good luck to the owner. Got it. It depicts a cat with a paw raised. In a Japanese beckoning uh, gesture. It should be this gesture, but it's actually like this, okay? They're displayed in shops, restaurants, and other businesses, generally near the entrance. And some are equipped with a mechanical paw, which moves back and forth. We kind of know what these things... And they're usually holding a gold coin at the base. Mm -hmm. So he's got a gold coin here and blah, blah, blah. Like a Meowth. <laughs> that's a Pokemon reference. <laughs> yes. Pokemon! Well, that's where it came from. So the Pokemon... Uh, figure oh. came from the Maniki Noko. That makes oh. sense. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Maniki no Moko. That sounds like that commercial. Remember when he was like, well, you know, welcome to Monaco Misa? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A statue with the left paw away. raised is to get more customers, while the right paw raised is beckoning in more money. So the one with the left paw is traditionally for businesses, and the one with the right paw you see in homes. Hmm. If you're going to give one, give one the correct one because of correct. me. According to Folk Tale, the operator of an impoverished shop. Took in, a, took in a starving straight cat, even though he was on the balls of his ass. He still said, oh, you know what, I'm going to help out the cat. This cat, in turn, sat at the front of his fucking restaurant and said, come on in. And people went crazy. They went in, the guy made a million dollars. That's the whole idea behind the Manico Nico. Be nice to cats. It yeah. just proves it. Others say the gesture mimics a cat washing its face. And there's a Japanese belief that a cat washing its face means a visitor will soon a lot, uh, arrive. I don't like that as much as I'm like, hey, come on, yeah. get in here, right? With all the Japanese ghosts around. I mean, maybe yeah. we don't want visitors. <laughs> yeah, coming, exactly. You know? uh, the rabbit's foot. Um, Europe, China, Africa, North and South America. This isn't like a Western thing. Rabbit's feet are everywhere. But the only variation is that there's certain ways to take the foot. There's certain places the rabbit has to be. There's certain attributes, method, all that. Some cultures need the rabbit to be killed by cross-eyed man. So, mince. Right? <laughs> Others need the rabbit to still be alive when the foot is taken. Oh. Some say it must be shot with a silver bullet. Or it must be the left hind foot, which was shot or otherwise captured in a cemetery. Grover Cleveland, heard of him? Had the foot of a rabbit that had been killed on the grave of Jesse James. That's pretty cool. Some sources tell that the rabbit must be taken by a full moon. Some say instead that the rabbit must be taken on a Friday, more specifically a rainy Friday, and even more specifically a rainy Friday the 13th. So if you just get like a, a rabbit's foot, you might not have a real one. Yeah, I, I didn't mean Mitzi, but that was the first place. Or my Aunt Bernie. My Aunt, Ber my Aunt Bernie also has <laughs> I, I got a rabbit's foot that I won at like a skee ball thing place where I got tickets. Yeah, and that's like, yeah, was it on a keychain? Yep. It's not a yep. real one. Yep. And it was yeah. tie dye. I don't like know. Colored. My sister had one. It, it like had green. Tie dye is bad luck. Yeah. My that's sister good. had one. It had it had like toenails. Like it was like mm -hmm. it was legit and it was gross. So there's, the a, there's an ancient <laughs> tradition called a dead man's hand, and whenever somebody is executed, keeping their hand and embalming it was good luck. And there was also a special candle that you made from the fat of the executed man and a wick made from his hair that was then placed inside the... I can't believe I'm fucking doing this from memory. So they have a dead man's hand with a candle made from his fat with a wick made from his hair. And if you lit the candle, you were safe from everything, but everybody around you was fucked. So that was kind of the start of the rabbit's foot thing. Look it up. Uh, and don't look it up now, but just take my word for it. 
this is one of the ones I was going to say. We started with half breeds. We're not we're not done yet. The Anika half breeds. I don't mean that. It was a for people who are just tuning in. It's a mascot up in Alaska. Now we're going to go to something called the Lucky Jew. Oof, I don't Ooh. like this one. Mm. It's good luck in Poland to have a small statue of a Hasidic Jew holding coins at the entrance to your house. And it, they <laughs> don't mean anything by it. They don't mean anything by it, but it's just tone deaf. It's supposed to bring you good fortune. Opinions vary. Some cultural studies say it promotes Polish-Jewish dialogue and think it's harmless folklore and nostalgia, while others believe it's anti-Semitic and an offensive stereotype like the lenders and the money and all that kind of stuff. The motif is often accompanied by sayings like, Jew in the hall, coin in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. Or that's he who bad. has no Jew at home is moneyless. It, These are Polish people saying this. It seems like a, like something from Borat. Like I feel like this yeah. is a Borat. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay. By the way, that can go either way depending on how you say it. If you're like an older Polish woman who like you know, comes to your new apartment and and gives you one of these things. Well, that's what's it's funny like about it. Like, like, yeah, you know I mean? exactly. Yeah, it's the and time like, frame. And Take it like, out of I context. I can see you saying, Jew in your house, money in your pocket. Or, you know, when you throw change on a guy who gets a new car or some bullshit. I, I can't even. According to a 2015 survey conducted in Poland, 65% of people recognized it. Like, they would walk in and be like, oh, I know that. It's a lucky Jew. Okay? 55% have seen it in family or friends' homes, and just around 18% actually had it in their homes. So it's not everywhere. 20% of people have it in their homes, 65% of people know it, 55% have seen it in somebody's house. Okay? In June 2021, the city of Krakow announced its plans to ban the sale of Jew with coin figurines in public events, and I think that's probably the right way to go. Well, because again, it's been taken out of context. Lawn jockeys, black lawn mm-hmm. jockeys. They used to be everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm. No espuano anymore. You can't have them anymore. You go on uh, Amazon like I did yesterday, you cannot find a black lawn jockey. Jew with a coin or a happy lucky Jew, you cannot find them on fucking Amazon. Mm-hmm. Here's the one that I think still has an acceptability to it. You guys tell me if I'm wrong. I own one of these. Mm-hmm. Cigar Story Indians. Is a cigar, and now you know I go to cigar lounges all the time. I was just in one the other day. I was blowing smoke rings, you know, I took my son. It's like part of the thing that I've been doing for a while. I'm sure that there's a stigma to me having it with Native Americans, but you, you can still buy them on Amazon. Not that that's my divining rod, but it's pretty close to it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I have uh, something similar, I guess, from my mom's side now, the Portuguese side. They all have like little almost like buddhas with coins yeah so but and and so the thing is is that there is no stigma yeah to, you know what i mean like a lot of people the tax lenders mm-hmm. and all that kind of exactly stuff. so yeah. it kind of flies but and they you, i've seen these so please people are looking home google lucky jew statues poland and you'll see that they're not um subtle they look like hasidim do you know what i mean and mm-hmm. you know the pious and and all the Kind of stuff and holding coins so it isn't and they're cartoonish as like garden gnomes tend to be like they, honestly it look like fucking garden gnomes so it exists now you know about it i think it's not going to exist for a long time the annika half breeds are around forever with this is the last time i'm shifting gears what's the luckiest deal ever struck I'm gonna have to bring this up on my phone in case my uh, the Louisiana purchase. Did, did we you, talked. No, we uh, we talked about it. Are you fucking kidding me? We talked about this. We had a whole episode on the Louis, yeah. Louis I did, and that's, yeah. that's 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 what I picked as the luckiest I'm, deal that we've ever. I'm struck. still looking at the the yeah. the, 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 <laughs> Jew, the lucky, lucky Jews. Deal? Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of <laughs> cute. On my phone? <laughs> no, I got it right here. Uh, so Louisiana purchase, and you know that I love the Louisiana purchase. People who who know this podcast know that we have an affinity for Louisiana purchase. So I'm going to tell you why. It's one of the luckiest deals that was ever struck. I'm going to push this way. I'm going to lean back. Is that all right? Are you okay? Yeah, Did yeah. You like I hate cigar? this fucking thing. Are you, are you hot? Yes. You? I, I'm like sticky. Like I feel it's, if it's I move my like. You're going to get is. up and it's going to be like. Yeah. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> rice in my fucking shorts. The Louisiana Purchase was the greatest real estate deal in the history of the United States. And a lot of it hinged on pure luck. I'm going to read this almost verbatim because there's so many goddamn details involved with this. The Louisiana Territory had many owners. So originally it was the Native American people. Then it was the French. 
then it was the Spanish, and then the French took it back, and then they sold it to the U.S., all right? So the Louisiana Territory had passed hands many times. Uh, and when they passed hands back to the French after the Spanish, that was around the time that Napoleon was in charge. So along comes Thomas Jefferson, his Secretary of State James Madison. They decided to fashion an alliance with the French government, with a big part of this relationship being the future governance of the Louisiana Territory. The U.S. needed to control the lands around the Mississippi to continue to grow, but they really did not have the military to just go and take it from France. And France was wanting to invade Britain and needed money for the invasion. So the U.S. needed the land and France needed the money. So eventually they negotiated the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, a deal that included 828,000 square miles. All right? So this includes New Orleans and nearly the whole Mississippi River Valley for $15 million, about $18 per square mile. $15 $15 million. That $15 million was actually only 11 plus the forgiveness of some French debt. But we'll stay with $15 million for now. And I don't think people understand this. The Louisiana Purchase bought us not only what we now know as the state of Louisiana, but what was the Louisiana Territory. Please stop thinking that it was just Louisiana. Louisiana, the whole fucking state, is around 53,000 square miles. It's smack dab in the middle of it's like ranked 25th for the size of states in the United States. Louisiana is not very big, right? So it's only 53,000 square miles. We got 828,000 square miles from this. So it stretched from the Delta Northwest all the way to Canada. So it enveloped Louisiana, a little bit of Texas, New Mexico, Minnesota, and Colorado. A little bit of all those. Texas, New Mexico, Minnesota, and Colorado. Most of North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana and all of Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Iowa. That's 828,000 square miles. That's a big fucking chunk of land. I've said this before. I don't think uh, schools get this point across, but the Louisiana Purchase had nothing to do with Louisiana, or at least very little. It was all the land from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Canada that the French had claimed for King Louis XIV. Louis, Louisiana. That's the only reason that it was called the Louisiana Purchase. But there was just one problem. The U.S. did not have $15 million to purchase this from the French. They needed to borrow most of the money, which was that $11 million, right? I told you some of it was forgivable debt. So what does the U.S. do? The British, Bering Bank in Britain, agreed to underwrite the loan. They loan America $11 million. We purchased this huge swath of land. Okay, so this is my point and this is what I'm going to end on. The Louisiana Purchase is the luckiest deal the U.S. ever struck because Britain loaned money to the U.S. to give to France who would use it to finance an invasion of Britain. And that's pretty lucky. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll talk to you next week. 